Welcome everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Director of um, Communications and Outreach with Maine Woodland Owners. We are a nonprofit organization serving the small woodland owners in Maine, providing the resources information that small woodland owners are craving uh, to help manage their woods and to support healthy forests in Maine. Um, today, we are focusing on the fundamentals of woodland ownership for those who are relatively new in this, uh, in this work. Um, a lot of um, great people own some beautiful woods, but it can be a very overwhelming experience. Tom Doak is the executive director of Maine Woodland Owners, and he is a forester, and he was the director of, for, of, the, of the Maine Forest Service back in the uh, early 2000s. Um, and is tremendously experienced in all that you should know as a woodland owner. And we also have Jeff Williams. He is a consulting forester in the Southern Maine, New York County uh, area. He um, actually was, uh, he learned at the knee of one of our past board presidents, Everett Toll, and has had uh, various experiences and is quite good working with new woodland owners. He's got actually a lot of clients who are new woodland owners. And so he agreed to be part of this program because it's um, important information that people should have. So I'm not going to talk much longer. I would like to just explain quickly how we will do question and answer. Today's format is very open. Uh, it's essentially a Q&A. So my hope is everybody has brought some questions. Um, Tom and Jeff are ready to answer those questions. Um, in my, uh, what I've experienced is that it's best if people um, usually uh, are verbally prov providing their questions. So if you do have a question, I'll be the one facilitating that part. Um, go ahead and turn on your, uh, your video if you can. And, and raise your hand, I will be looking for that. And um, then you can take off, turn off your mute. You can speak, ask the question, and hopefully this will help get you a, li a little further down the, the road of forest management uh, mysteries. And um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that or you don't have the capability for audio or vi video, and you just wanna send a question through the chat, make sure your chat box is open, click on the chat icon and then the box opens to the right and you can type in your question and everybody will see it, which will be good. We're all here to help each other and learn from each other. So I encourage that. Okay, so um, that's my spiel. I'm gonna pass it over to Tom Doak. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to uh, offer to Tom as an introduction, otherwise you folks can just jump right in and I'll, I'll, oh, no, I'll be on the lookout for people's hands and um, questions. I would just say that, um, uh, we've heard just about every problem and question you can imagine in the time we've been doing this. So please feel free to ask any question you want. And, you know, and if we need to follow up with you later or something about something in particular, we'll do that with you. So whatever, you, whatever works, but, um, you know, we'll fire away with any question you have. And um, between Jeff and I, we'll, we'll have an answer for you. I don't see anybody asking. Well, let me start with something that I think is the, one of the most important things. And I, I do a course on the 10 biggest mistakes that landowners make. And um, I'm always surprised how many people actually show up. I think I've done it 45 times now, probably with this presentation. And actually I have 11, but I call it 10 for marketing purposes. So, uh, and I don't know, maybe something, I don't know if any of you have attended one of those, but it's a, it's a it's an interesting kind of discussion, but the, the number one thing that I talk to people about is knowing what you own. And it's an odd situation, but a lot of people um, don't actually know where, where on the ground their land is. And so the first kind of principle is to kind of know what you have and, and where it is on the ground. And so I always talk to people about, that's kind of the first step is uh, being able to identify it on the ground. And, a question I get a lot of times from people is, do I need a survey? Most woodland in Maine is not surveyed. Um, most of it is described in a deed, but those deeds are often old, you know, from 
adjoining the farm of so-and-so and if you look back at the deeds, but being able to identify it on the ground is really kind of critical. And so, uh, you know, sometimes a, sur a survey is nice to have, um, but I also have helped landowners um, work together to identify a boundary line or have a mutual agreement on a line and cure some problems. So we start with just saying the most important thing is to be able to find it on the ground and then, and then go from there. So I don't know if that triggered anybody's questions <laughs> or, or anything, but um, fire away. Yep. We did get a question. Oh, Annalise, go, go right ahead. Turn on. That's perfect. Hi. Uh, yeah, actually, what Tom was saying, uh, my husband and I kind of inherited this land. My dad went ahead and gave it to us. Um, in uh, it's in Marion County, and um, we he had put it originally in that forest juice. Tree tax. growth in the tree growth tax law program. Tree growth, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when I got the land and he deeded it to me and then he decided just, you know, he, he had life rights to it for a while, but he decided to just make sure I had it. And so I continued that and we did at least one 10 year renewal. And I think we're near the end of that. Um, the last time I did it, they did advise me that I should, it might be uh, where I could get some, a couple of acres to be thinned out. We had, I think it's like 40 acres. But the tough thing about it is most of it is on a, a very steep hill, very rocky and rugged. Um, I think it was land that had been forested in the last 50 years or something mm -hmm. by uh, Georgia Pacific, I think, or uh -huh. one of the big companies, Northern Paper, I think it was Great called. Northern, or something. Yeah. yeah, and it, uh, not a lot of that land around there had already been forested. So it still needed more growth. The thing is it, it's, it's kind of tough because the shape of the land is like really long and sort of oblong looking rectangular. Um, but anyway, I'm concerned about if I had to do anything, it would just be like a light thinning harvest. But I don't want to get into anything that's going to cost us a lot of money up front without being able to get money out of it to sort of pay for the work. Right. Um, and I don't know the company that we've hired to do the forest juice. He was going to check into it last year. I haven't heard back yet. So I was going to contact him again. He said that the market was really bad right now. So I just, part of me is afraid of, I'm not too worried about getting it done, except that I don't want to run afoul of any of the laws in Maine okay. regarding the tax status, all of a sudden saying okay. that we're not doing our part. Yeah. Well, I can. I think I can help you with that a little bit, and probably there are other people in the Trigo Tax Law Program in the and on the call. So, um, so the Trigo Tax Law Program taxes land at its ability to grow trees instead of its development value. So it's a, a significant benefit to the landowners. All the lands that we own as an organization are also in the program, so we we work with it all the time. Um, and I probably spend more time on this than any other subject. So it's. You, the requirements, and you're talking about, you know, the requirements that go with it, you can't develop the property uh, without paying the penalty and taking some out, but you have to have a management plan and follow the plan and every 10 years, updated plan and, and the landowner certifying that, uh, you know, forester certifying that you're compliant with the plan. The program is designed for people that are interested in harvesting, so if you're never interested in harvesting, this is not the program for people. Um, but also, you know, the, it, there's a, as long as your intention is and you're showing an intention to manage the land and um, market, you know, my poor markets are an excuse not to harvest, um, things like that. But eventually you're going to want to have some harvest. Um, and so, you know, the forester, I would I talk to the, you know, go back to the forester and talk to them about the markets. Markets for most, for some products are terrible right now and some are very, very good. Um, and Jeff's nodding his head. So, I'd be guided by that forester um, who should be helping you to make sure you're in compliance. But ultimately, yes, at some point you want to do some management and it's going to be good, you know, good for you. But it is an expectation that you're going to harvest and lose money. That's not ever been, been the expectation of people in the Trebo Tax Law Program. So I'm happy to, if I don't answer your questions fully today because we've got a limited amount of time, you're welcome to contact me directly and I'll work you through any problem you have on your own particular property. So this well, is not actually, the last resource for you. Kind of as a follow-up to that, if 
we find that this timber harvesting isn't for us, especially where we live in Florida now. Um, and we're a little bit, we're retired now. We really uh -huh. don't want to start getting into learning something new at this point. Uh -huh. um, and my son and my husband's son, they're not going to be interested in the, in the future. Uh -huh. If we were to take it out of this timber growth, what kind of, how, I asked about it with somebody in the state and they said they can't tell me how much it would cost until we actually did it. Is there a way of estimating what the penalty would be? The assessor, I, the assessor absolutely can tell you how much it would cost uh, to take it out. And so you should ask the assessor. Um, the other option for you, you know, and the penalties could be significant. So you never want to do that without knowing. There's another program called Open Space that you could transfer your land into. It doesn't have a management plan requirement. No, no, no requirement to harvest trees. Same thing. You can't develop. You know, can't develop it without a penalty. But it's a much simpler program. The tax taxes would be would be higher, but not necessarily significantly higher. But a lot less to worry about. So, a forester should be able to talk to you about that. But if you have any questions that come up, you know, give me a call or email me, and I'll and I'll walk. I'll walk you through it. Tom, I'm gonna to type in your email in the chat. Sure, yeah. yeah. And um, same with you, Jeff, I'll put yours in there as well. Okay, Other, great. Did, uh, did you wanna jump in there with any thoughts there, Jeff? I, the only thing that really um, piqued my interest was when you, you mentioned you'd spoken with a forester and, and he mentioned that the markets weren't great. Um, and, and that is um, a reality in some cases, a lot of the low grade products in Maine are, are hard to sell um, either because the mills are just full they have all the wood they need at certain times a year and we've had a extended period of drought up here so a lot of mills in Maine prepare in the spring for a long mud season and will stock up on wood they'll buy a whole bunch and fill, fill yards up and then they'll use that wood through spring assuming that there won't be a lot of logging going on so that um, throughout the year that market changes over time um, but oftentimes in the spring, there's there's quite a bit of wood at the mills. Um, so the markets are sometimes slow, depending on the product. Great. Um, let's see, David, you have your video on. Are you do you have a question that you'd like to ask or are you? You're, oh, and I see something from John as well. So, David, did you want to jump in for the question? No. OK. Um, John Horan wrote, I am looking to buy a 500 acre lot, plus or minus, what should I be looking for? I would like it to be self-supporting with taxes, et cetera. I'll, I'll start and then Jeff, you, I'm sure you'll have some things to add. Sure. Um, a couple of things to look for access. You know, if you're looking to buy land, you want, do you have access? Do you have legal access to it? And that's pretty darn key. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to do that, um, and then um, looking at what's growing there, but also, uh, you know, the, the, how good a site that is, is a good growing ground, but also what is growing there. And I deal with people all the time that, you know, just because they're big trees doesn't mean they're valuable. People think big trees are valuable and they can be, but, you know, depending upon the species and the quality, quality is really a key. Um, species are important too, but you'd want to look at, at quality and then you want to look at uh, I've dealt with a few people that have bought land and, and um, there are other rights somebody else owns on that land. And once in a while, you know, so to know those kind of things. 500 acres is a big piece of land. Um, a lot of the land, you can usually tell when you're looking for land, if it's just lightly wooded, that's kind of means um, it's had a pretty recent heavy harvest. That's the wording, lightly wooded that really means you're going to be a long time before you do much on it. So Jeff, do you want to add some things? Um, I usually just tell people that when you're looking at land, um, if you want it to be sustainable over time, obviously timber, the, the quality and volume of timber per acre is important. Um, but if it's something that you're looking to purchase, that's going to be part of the family long-term, you're going to give it to your kids or other members of the family. You really want to pay attention to soils because ultimately that's what you're buying. Um, and, and you can find that information online for free. You can look at the soil types based on um, state data and, and determine how productive those lands can be over time. Um, 
that would be my advice is take a good look at what soils there are. Take a look at the topography, how much land is actually um, usable in terms of forest land, because there could be forested wetlands or, or other areas that may not be productive. Um, certainly on a 500, 500 acre parcel, you'll have those sections where it, it won't be, um, you, won't, you won't have merchantable timber or you won't be able to use that ground because it's too wet. It's not a bad idea to, frankly, to, uh, if you're, if you're going to make that kind of an investment, it's not a bad idea to have a forester to take a look at it with you. You know, uh, the cost of having a forester for half a day or something to, to look at it for you or with you, ideally with you, um, probably pays off because you, you, you know, it's a significant, it would be a significant investment and you'd want to get some sense from a forester what the, what the potential is. So that's, that would be my suggestion. You can also um, ask the seller if, if you can, you can hire a forester to go do a timber inventory on it prior to yeah. making an offer or purchase and sale in some cases. The, the other option you have is often at 500 acres, I wouldn't be surprised if that landowner has some, uh, some information on the property and uh, you know, would they share that with you in advance? John, did you uh, want to follow up with another question on that on on their response, John Horan? Uh, okay. I see. Uh, I see a couple others. Uh, the soils yep. information, Jeff. Can you can you yep put something um, up on there? What if, where it is? If you go, if you just Google Web Soil Survey. Um, you will come up with a USDA website and you can draw your parcel in based on the entire U US um, and it'll generate that soil survey for that property and give you all types of tables and information that you can click through based on forest land productivity um, and a number of other qualities, development things and stuff like that. Um, but it'll give you a general rundown of what soil types are there. And then um, if you really dig into it, you can get into the um, site indices of each tree species, but that's that's going pretty far down the rabbit hole. So it's the USDA website, and you type in. If you, uh, yep, it's web it's actually soil web survey. soil survey web soil survey dot sc dot egov dot usda dot gov. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, I just got it. I'll throw it in there now. Okay, great. Oh, so I, I see a a, a John, follow up. John, John followed up. Yep. Yeah. John, so John. Um, uh, I don't know where actually you, you are, but um, I'm happy to have you give me a, uh, drop me an email or something and I can help you um, find, a, uh, you know, two or three, I usually, I usually suggest two or three different forces in a particular area. And I have no stake in who you work with. We don't, I get no, you know, we're completely separate from that. So, mm -hmm. but I can give you some names of some people in your area that you might want to contact that, that either I, we know personally uh, members have had good luck with or have done work on lands that we own. And again, I'm not, not necessarily recommending one over another, but I can help you sort through good ones versus some that might not be. So, um, And then I, there was a question, a question about a harvest from Jim, I think it was earlier, right? That, yeah. And Jim, is this the Jim I spoke to on the phone yesterday? If so, you want to unmute and um, jump in with your question? Let's see. I think he's got it print. He's got it written there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Jim called me yesterday. I believe this is the same one. He, I'm interested in harvesting 13 to 15 acres of mature timber. How can I proceed to estimate the value before I proceed with a harvest? It does seem a little bit like chicken and the egg. It, you know, what comes first, chicken or the egg? Um, a bit. Um, how do you get in there? So, yeah, if you can answer that. Jeff, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Sure. I can start and then follow up. Um, Typically, if you hire a licensed forester to manage it, if it's mature timber, uh, depends on where it is in the state and what the timber is in terms of uh, species, but it may be valuable enough to, to warrant having a forester involved. Um, and in that case, a lot of foresters like myself will paint the trees to be cut individually based on the objectives of the landowner and will also scale each tree that's painted. So you'll have a pretty good sense of that volume going forward before you even select a contractor or allow the, the forester to recommend some contractors to you um, to then contract that sale and administer the sale. 
Um, so you should know ahead of time. Um, if you decide not to use a forester, I'm always in favor of using one, but if you decide to go forward without one, um, the logger should provide you with scale slips of every single load that leaves your property um, from whatever buyer that purchases that, that load. So you should have a scale of every, every log that leaves the lot, or if it's fiber uh, like pulp or chips, you should have a scale slip from um, each truck, what the weight was. Um, so you should have a pretty good idea at the end of the sale, what you sold. And if you want to know ahead of time, a forester can help you with that. Um, I, I would add that you should always have a written contract on these situations and uh, any good uh, forester or logger, um, that's good for them too. So any good one will want a contract because they want it clear, you know, what they're responsible for. So anybody who doesn't want to have a signed contract, that's a, that's a flag generally. Um, I also can tell you that I help a lot of people who will send me a contract and say, are these prices fair? You know, and the prices vary a lot depending on the situation. So there's no, there's no magic number uh, on pricing because a lot of it depends on quality and the location and the difficulty of access. There's a lot of things that go into it, but I can generally help someone to know if these, if these seem like a reasonable numbers and the same thing with a, a fee that a forester might charge. I can help you, I can help you sort through that because uh, there's a range at which most of them would fall. And uh, so I'm happy to help you on, a, on, your, on your particular situation. So happy to talk with you directly. I've seen, I've helped some people. Uh, most of them are pretty fair proposals. I've seen some that are not and I've helped people with that. And I always suggest you talk to more than one. I mean, competition's a good thing. Jeff, Jeff's a consulting force. Jeff is used to competing for his services with others. Uh, it's, it's just a good idea frankly, um, to be, to, to get, uh, and you may just, you may just want to, you may have ver two, two or three really good forces, but one of them may relate to you better or something like that. And, you know, price isn't always the best judge of that, but um, watch out for an outlier. Um, if some of the price is way different from some of that you're talking to, that's usually a sense of something else is happening there, usually. This relates a little bit to, it looks like a question in the chat of how do I find a good forester? And to that, I would say um, your district forester who works for the main forest service, if you give them a call, they will have a list of the local foresters that work in your area. Um, and they'll give you a list of three or four or five and you can give them, um, just shop around, give each one a call and, and give them a sense of, of what you're looking for over the phone and then decide who to meet with in person. Uh, but they would be the, the go-to resource for finding a local consultant who's reputable and, and knows the area and knows the markets and knows the contractors in the area. I would also say you don't, you know, we always suggest a forester. All of our operations are under, under the direction of forester, but there are, it doesn't mean you have to. There are some good, reliable logging contractors that can do a really good job without a forester. I mean, our suggestion is you use them, um, particularly if you're not around in the area, you're not there. Um, because um, it's really to get a sense, you know, the, the forester's job is partly to, to be your agent, but also to understand exactly what you want to have happen on the property. But there are people that work very successfully without a forester. Um, it usually pays to do it, I think, but um, that doesn't mean you have to. Jeff, what got me thinking, so what's, what's the What's typical experience of uh, someone who's called you at, you know, for the first time and said, I, I'm looking for a forester, um, what's next? Most of the time I'll ask them over the phone, uh, how much do they own, how long they've owned it, uh, and if they've done any harvesting in the past and what their long-term goals are for. And that will give me a general sense if I'm the right fit for that person. Um, and if they're interested in meeting, I'll go out and meet with them for free. I'll spend a couple hours on their woodlot. We can go out, take a quick walk, give them just kind of a general overview of what I see. Um, and I don't charge for that service. And you'll find a lot of foresters who won't. Um, so you can get some general information just by giving a consultant a call to see if uh, you'd like to work with them and have them out on your lot. Um, and then from there, it typically either goes towards some type of, of overview write up or a full blown forest management plan on the property. Um, 
and there's a number of resources for those for for typical like uh for cost share and other other ways to minimize your expense for that jeff, jeff makes a really good point the consulting forces are are you know are used to doing a, a walk and looking at the property for free and you should always confirm that with them but that is typical and that's not an unreasonable thing for them to it's part of their business you know to how they get business so they will go and and um, spend a couple hours with you and walk around if they think there's any opportunity there i mean so um so that's not unreasonable expectation on your part that a forester would come out and give you some general sense and talk about the services they provide and what what they could do for you or not so that's uh, a, a, that's a good thing to add um, there is a question about my woodlot is across the border in New Brunswick. Um, do the do they have prevention provision? Pro, pro, uh, do they have forces that work? Or do they like that? <laughs> that? Provincial. No. Anyway, the Can I don't know. Do you know, Jeff? I, I just know the Canadian the can, the rules in, in Canada are very different than the U.S. as far as harvesting and depending on the province you're in can be very very different. Um, uh, some of them have marketing boards and things like that. And I don't really know about the question about New Brunswick. It would, there's, no, I'm sure there's a, there's a government ser service there in New Brunswick that would be the place to reach out to talk to them. It's very, very different. In Maine, if you're a forest, if, if someone says they are a forester in Maine, they, that means they have a license. Um, they are licensed. If someone, if you're talking to someone who says they're a forester, you can go to the, you can Google Maine Professional Forester Licensing Board and, and their name will be there. If they are a forester, they will be there. Their license number will be there. And, and if there's any action been taken on a forester's license, there's a, that will be show up too. So um, if you're confused, if someone is claiming to be a forester and you don't think they are or something, or they can't prove that to you, that website will tell, tell you their status. He did a follow-up question. About 60 acres of our lot was clear cut about eight years ago, mostly poplar poles up and thick up, up and yeah. thick now. It is advised and worth, is it advised and worth the while to thin that out? Boy, Jeff, I don't I don't see a lot of people thinning popple. Um, it's a really quick growing species. There's always a market for popple in this country, in this state at least. Um, but most of the time people just let it grow and it shorts itself out in a pretty short order. But eight, eight years, I don't know people that are pre-commercially thinning popple. That's pretty, uh, that would be unusual. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, but it brings up a good point that if, uh, I know it's New Brunswick, so obviously it's different than uh, the United States, but if there's cost share available, so if there's financial assistance from the government or the state level, to consider doing um, any kind of thinning pre-commercially, which means you don't make any income on it. It's just an investment into your woodlot. Um, it may be worth it long-term to do to something, maybe not with Popple, but um, in some other cases, certainly. What are some, thing, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, going back to what Tom brought up first, um, in the 10 mistakes woodland owners make, um, the number one thing that I would emphasize that Tom brought up was, was knowing what you own, where, where it is. And there's a number of good resources for this. If you're um, maybe just not certain about going out into your woods, you're, uh, let's say maybe you own 60 acres and you have your trails and, and you stick to your trails or however you enjoy your woodlot. Um, if, if you have an iPhone or a smartphone, which almost everybody does, it seems these days, there's a number of apps you can use. Google Earth is a good one. Um, another one is Hunt Stand. You can search that. It shows all of the town tax map data on, on the um, phone, and it shows your location within those tax maps. So you can find your general location in proximity to your boundary based on what the town thinks you own. So it's not perfect, um, but it's a good starting point if you don't know where your boundaries are to go look for evidence of your boundaries. Um, another one is on X hunt and all of these come with free trials. 
Um, they do have, I, I think most of them are a $30 annual fee um, if you do want to maintain the use of the data, um, of the town parcel data. But um, they're a great resource for landowners who don't know where their lot is and, and maybe a little bit hesitant to go out and just tromp through the woods and, and find them on their own. Jeff, what was the first one? The first one is uh, hunt stand. Huntstand.com. Yep, I think so. Okay. You can find it on the app store and it's a free download to get started with it. Um, the, the, things um, I, the things I hear from landowners often is uh, one of their biggest regrets is they don't they didn't start early enough in doing things. And, mm -hmm. um, and then the other, but I also hear the fear of, well, I'm afraid to do something because I don't really understand it and things like that. And it, it, it shouldn't be that complicated. And if you work with good people, you, you, know, you can solve a lot of those problems. But most people said, gee, I wish I'd started something earlier um, and just gotten, gotten going. And you know, if you, and if you just kind of, start a little project, don't bite off something too big. Uh, it's really gets you interested. And then the other thing I would say, you should not feel pressured by somebody. I deal with people that'll get a phone call from someone. I, I, got a, I was talking to someone this week who said they were told that they really ought to have a harvest right now because the markets are, you know, the markets for their wood is really good. And, and oh, by the way, um, and this is even a forester saying to, you know, it, I need to mark the trees now before the leaves come out because then it's easier to, it's, I can do a better job of marking trees when the leaves aren't on. I'm, I've never heard that one uh, before. And Jeff, I would say to you, I'm sure Jeff would tell you that, you know, may, yeah, you can see the tops yeah. of the trees, but that's not a reason to make a judgment about when you want to harvest your tree. So you should never feel pressured by someone who says, you got to do it now or the trees will get too big or, or something, you know, don't, don't let them pressure you, but don't be afraid to do something. That's the other part of it. It's a balance. I would comment on your, your uh, comment, Tom, that I actually prefer to wait for the leaves to come out to see if you can see crown dieback and you yeah. can really assess the health better. That's what I told this so. landowner. I said, from, as a forester myself, I want to see how good the crown is. And I can tell yeah. that when the leaves come out, because then I can see whether it's a healthy crown or not. So I, I, I'd rather, I just didn't do it with the leaves on, with the leaves on personally. Uh, the, the mentor I uh, worked under, Everett, always told people, when I first started in this business, and I didn't quite understand it because I was young and didn't have children, but if anybody on the call has children, he always told people having a woodlot is like having a baby, and the joy is in watching it grow over time. So the sooner you start managing and understanding what you have and enjoying it, it it's really fruitful long term to really watch it grow and change and be part of that change towards what your objectives are. That's great. Um, and, and it, you know, I think one thing we find among our members and people we talk to is there's probably a 2,500 different reasons why people own woods. It's a very personal choice. It's very, you know, has a lot to do with their circumstance. It may have been something they didn't think they were going to be part doing or having 10 years ago and then life changes and all of a sudden you do have the land or something you'd always thought about doing and you finally had the opportunity. And I think that's what's most interesting about woodland ownership, especially up in Maine, because the heritage is so rich. One thing that we like to let people know and remind them as an organization, we, we remind people we talk to, Maine has the most private land, of uh, forest land than any state in the country. So it's not only is it this, this experience of watching something grow and taking care of it like your own children, you're also contributing towards the greater health of the forest in Maine. And that's, I think that that adds a layer to that, um, to that, ur not urgency, but the specialness of the experience and knowing that it's part of a bigger picture. And uh, so that's, you know, probably the one thing I like about my job is I'm, I'm talking to people who have really stepped up and are taking, um, a really important job and making making things um, good for someone like me. I don't own land, but I, I do have a deep appreciation for people who do it. Um, so what is, uh, Tom, what is your, um, what would be one thing you wish people would know um, 
when you when you first talk to them and they're new in woodland ownership? You know, one of, there's a couple things that come to mind and um, a lot of people care about wildlife. I mean, I think the most common denominator among woodland owners in the state and, and is that they, they all, um, I haven't met one yet that didn't care about wildlife. Now some want to see them and some want to shoot them. And, but I mean, they, you know, everybody cares about wildlife. And, and I would say, you know, there's a fear that doing anything will somehow impact wildlife. And it's true, it will, doing something will impact wildlife, doing nothing will also impact wildlife. And there are opportunities to, to kind of improve your habit, improve your land or, you know, for, for wildlife. And you, you shouldn't be afraid to do something, you know, do some, do some things and think about the things. The other thing I, I hear a lot from people is they feel like sometimes that they have to do what the professional person is telling them they should do. And, you know, there's a difference. They, a professional person like a forester is going to help you make sure you're complying with the law. But a good forester will also listen to you, or a logger, will listen to what you want. And there are multiple ways to do some things. There's not an only one way. And it is your land. And so being able to express to someone exactly what you want to have done is important. And, you know, you're only going to harvest every once every 15 or 20 years, probably. So the, tr the trick is how do you enjoy your land and get involved with it and in those other, you know, 14 to 19 years when you're not doing harvesting. But um, it's the forest is changing all the time. And uh, I, I was I, I own 135 acres. I've owned it for 35 years. And uh, just last week, I saw the biggest pine tree I have on the property that I had never seen before. So there's always something to see on your property if you look if you keep looking around at it. Great. I want to just follow up on Tom's point real quick. Sure. I think that the most important thing you can do as a new landowner um, or even an, a landowner who's had land for some time um, is don't be hesitant to express your level of knowledge to a forester. Don't hesitate. Don't be embarrassed to say, I don't know my tree species. I don't know, you know anything. I don't know a birch from a pine tree because the most important thing that you, you can talk with them about at that point is um, what you do know. And they'll write that plan to a level that you'll actually understand where many foresters are so stuck in a rut of writing forest management plans that it may be a document. If you don't let them know your level of knowledge, it may be a document that means absolutely nothing to you in a lot of cases. Um, and we'll just go sit on a shelf where a, a management plan ought to be a working document, something you understand, something you can digest and really put on the ground and implement. That's great. Um, there's a question from uh, Annalise. Did you want to, uh, do you want me to read it or would you like to unmute and? Uh, uh, well, I see it's about, it's about, it? it's about how to treat taxes, right? So okay. taxes, um, Woodland taxes are a little bit complex, uh, to be honest with you. Um, so income, at least in Maine, in, uh, so income from timber harvesting is a long-term capital gain on federal income tax. And in Maine, it's considered ordinary income, if that, if that means anything to folks. Um, the trick on taxation is to understand what your basis is. It's kind of like stocks. You pay your taxes on the gain not on and so if you bought it it's you know that's your basis and then you or or the day the day you inherit the day you inherit it is is the value then um but 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 my experience has been the account accounting for timber sales is is a complicated um is somewhat complicated and most accountants don't understand it i'm looking at jeff he probably deals with this a lot but we we um we help people a lot of times with uh, helping them get to the right person. And we actually have a, a former board member who is retired from the IRS, who was a forester, and he has helped dozens and dozens and dozens of landowners with their taxes. And it's, it's not overly expensive, but uh, to have someone like that help you, but it, it sure. generally gonna save a lot of money. Does that, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, yeah, you you know, I, you you do have to you do have to pay taxes on on it, but most he will tell you that mo the vast majority of people end up paying more than they should have to pay because they don't understand how taxes are handled in forestry operations. Okay. 
I would that add one help. thing to that. Yeah. I would add one thing, and that is if you do have a good forest management plan, when you first buy or inherit a property, you have your inventory of what's there. So you can calculate your gains uh, long-term based on growth. So if you have that information, you can work backwards in some cases. If you have an inventory at year 10, you bought it 10 years ago, you can work backwards on 3% roughly to try and figure that out. But it takes quite a bit of math to do it by species. And it can, it can get fairly complicated. Um, but having a forest plan with a good inventory sets you up for that tax uh, cost basis long-term and you can work that out forever. Yeah, that, that, that helps me. Um, I think that part of it is I'm paralyzed because of the concept of having to deal with all this paperwork or something too. The actual harvest, even if we just paid for it ourselves and we didn't expect anything, I'd be in compliance with the plan. Plus, we do want to manage it for the beauty of the woods and be able to, the walkability. We don't have any real formal trails, but we have a beautiful long sort of driveway and it goes to a camp that my dad built. And we want to maintain at least that immediate area around the camp. Two acres are not in the forest growth, um, the, the timber growth, but yeah, the two growth. acres yeah. near the camp yeah. are. We'd like to thin out that part, which the forester agreed that would be the most reasonable course to yeah. take. Um, it's just that, oh, is this going to be worth it when you're talking about pay taxes and the cost and everything? That's the hard part to know. Right. Okay. A good forester can give you the a pretty good estimate about what what your what your what you would get from a harvest. Jeff, There's do you a, want to jump in with this next question uh, yeah, yeah. from Peter? Do you see do you see that one, Jeff? Let me pull it up. It says we just purchased fifteen wooded acres in York County today. Congratulations! Yeah, that's <laughs> the first thing I would say. Um, it's where, a, where we it's are a wicked market out there. Yeah where we are thinking of a couple of small houses and leaving the rest pretty well wooded, but thinned. Is it worthwhile engaging a forester to look at that relatively small parcel with us? It's pretty old growth. The 47 fire did not go through this land. I would say it's worthwhile in the sense that you could, you could have somebody come out um, initially just as a, a consultant walk and probably get it for free and, and give you some direction on where um, they think you ought to go. And if it turns into a conversation about a mm -hmm. harvest, um, they'll be able to help you with that process or give you an estimate of what their cost would be and likely what you would earn uh, for income on that. But obviously, if you do have it harvested, um, a forester will, will help you achieve the aesthetic you're looking for. Um, and a lot of my job in Southern Maine, where I work, I, I am almost always surrounded by housing developments. Um, and, and aesthetics always plays a role in, in management around here because people want to be good neighbors. Um, and having a forester manage a timber harvest will help you achieve the aesthetic you're looking for, um, where oftentimes if one is not involved, a logger is not concerned about aesthetics. They're concerned about income um, and getting the job done as quickly as they can to move on to the next one. Um, where a lot of times a forester will make sure things move a little bit more slowly and, and methodically and, and done right. It's kind of a typical question. I was actually talking to someone yesterday who only has three or four acres. Um, I would, I'd say at that point, at that size, it's a little small for uh, having a forester. Is that right? Uh, District Forester will still come out to three to four acres from the state and, and give you some advice. Yeah. The, the hope is she's actually abuts um, a lot of acres owned by mm -hmm. someone else. And I think her hope is that at some point she could acquire some more land. So my, and I'm thinking that's pretty typical that you, um, you get some sort of small parcel, but you, you add to it over time. So probably having a good baseline or at least a good start with the first parcel and then building from that is, is a useful thing. One thing I do as a forester, and this can sometimes complicate a sale, but I will send letters to all of others, notifying them of the intent of the owner with the owner's permission um, to let them know we're doing a commercial harvest. It's for whatever objective X, Y, Z, um, and let, allow them to call with questions. And sometimes we'll get small owners budding who want to then have some wood harvested. Um, sometimes there's there's payment for that wood, sometimes not. Um, but it all depends on the person who is uh, originally starting that sale that I would be working for. 
and it would be their permission to allow that to occur through their property. Um, but that does happen quite often. Uh, and sometimes smaller lots can piggyback on abutting woodlots to achieve a goal alongside their abutter and work in tandem. Great. Uh, Christine, I bought a home on 93 acres last year in Washington County. I've met with the district forester who provided information around different options, TGLT, RAP. I'm certain, uncertain about specific goals at this point. Should I have specific goals before I work with a licensed forester or could they help, clarify goal, help me clarify goals? Great question, that's a great question. So yeah, basically, how prepared should that person be before they work with a forester? I find a lot of time just having conversation with a, floor, a forester can really flush out some of those goals. A lot of people, when they buy land, they may not have any kind of idea. They just want to, they know they want to own land. They know they want privacy. Um, and sometimes it just starts there. And you take a walk. And, and a lot of people have the objective, like Tom said, of either wildlife or a healthy forest. Um, and a forester, just having an hour conversation in a woodlot walking can help you really narrow in on some of those things. And, and they'll ask the right questions to flush out some of those answers of, of what you might really be concerned about, what you may not have thought about previously. Yeah, a really good forester will walk with you like that and, and, and talk, start asking you questions about, well, is this important and what's important to you? And, you know, here's a possibility. What do you think of that? Or gee, this, you know, those kind of things. So as you walk along, they, a good forester will, will prompt you in a lot of ways and talk about pluses and minuses of the certain things. And so, yeah. yeah, and certain owners I've walked with aren't very talkative. Um, so I'll just walk and talk. I'll tell them what I see, you know, what, what could be possibly done. Um, and sometimes that generates a conversation. And, and sometimes the recommendation is don't do anything. I mean, I mean, there, or there may not be much to do at some point, um, but, or, but here's the, you know, here's the first things you could do or things like that too. So she mentioned, uh, I think it was, she, she mentioned tree growth tax law in the RAP, the resource action plan through the main forest service. Um, there is other options. There is also the NRCS, which provides cost share funding for forest plans. Um, it's through the USDA. Uh, it's a slower process than the main forest service uh, rat plans, um, but it's a higher cost share percentage. I believe they work towards 75% of the total cost. Um, but again, it's, it's federal, federally funded. So it's, it's far more paperwork and it's a bit slower process. It's usually a year before you actually get funded when you sign up. And I can give more information if, if people and Tom as well can give more information on that program if they're interested. How, how um, common is it to meet with more than one forester? You know, is it, is it like any type of shopping or any type of relationship building you're doing? That, is that something that you would recommend? Or if you meet with one and you feel connected, that's, that's just fine as well? I mean, what's, what are your recommendations as far as, you know, second opinions and dating, I guess? You could, you know, try different... <laughs> trying different types of foresters. I mean, I, I think in some areas of the state, there's only so many foresters. And so you kind of have to get who's available, but maybe not, yeah. maybe there is some opportunity to try a couple. I would say, I would say probably only one out of 10 clients actually tell me that. Uh, so I probably am on the wrong side of that question. I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, but if they call me, then I know it was successful. But uh, I always encourage people, even after we walk, I say, look, if if you're uneasy about anything I've told you, or, you know, there may be a better option for you, you know, don't feel free to call around. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's always wise, even if you really um, like the person, the first one you meet, it's not a bad idea to get another viewpoint. And the, the, the forcers shouldn't be upset about that. I mean, they, you know, this is their, they're in a competitive business and they shouldn't be upset about that. If they are, they probably, it's probably the wrong person for you anyway. So I, it, it can happen. You may just be very comfortable with that person. And that happens, I think, I think probably quite a bit, but there's no reason not to have somebody else take a look at it with you. There's also, uh, foresters do kind of fall into niche categories in some cases. Some will specialize in certain things. 
Um, like for myself, I, I specialize in working in congested areas around development on woodlots, as well as doing invasive plant management. Um, so you may find somebody who just maybe doesn't fit what you're working towards for your objectives. Um, and that's perfectly okay. And if they're a good forester, they'll let you know who may be a better fit if it's something that they don't specialize in. We have about five or six minutes left before the end of this program. Who would like to jump in with a question? Peter, a question. You, you got it. Yeah, I'm Peter. curious to know uh, the uh, markets right now for some specific species that we would typically harvest in Maine. Go ahead. What are the what markets like for some of them? Yeah, market prices by species. Market prices by species. Yes. Um, so right now, you know, if you could, if it's if it's going to lumber, the lumber market is extremely good right now. And um, so if you can sell spruce and fir saw logs and pine saw logs and things like that, then you've got a good market for it. Although I got to tell you, the pricing that you see in the store is not reflected in the pricing that landowners are getting. So no. it's not, if there's a trickle down, it's not trickling down, uh, believe me. Uh, so you're not, seeing, you're not seeing a lot of increase in pricing on the local, on the landowner side of it. I'm not quite sure where all the money is, but it, it's not in the landowner side. And I don't think it's in the logger side either. Um, but then, so so any so the solid the wood, the lumber markets are really good. The low the problem right now is in the lower grade the pulpwood markets for you know spruce fir hemlock uh, hemlock's so not bad but pine it's terrible spruce and fir are very difficult so right now um, and you know some sometimes you want to time a market because if you're only going to harvest every 15 to 20 years, you, you might want to, if you've got a particular product, you might want to talk to someone about what the market is at, at that moment, because that's your one chance to have a harvest in 15 to 20 years. And you probably, you might want to sell it wood when it's the market is good for that product. Jeff, do you where want to you, add anything? Where are you located, Peter? T7 R11. Oh, you've got, well, you've got oh. Coast County. You've yeah. Got, yeah. That's out of my area. I wouldn't, have a, I wouldn't have a clue. I can tell you all I know from down in, in Southern Maine is that uh, pine pulp doesn't exist, essentially. Um, hemlock pulp isn't bad, but it's there. The markets are full. Um, they'll pay for it when they want it. And it's only going to be a few dollars a ton, um, if that at most. Um, but it, like Tom said, all the Dimension products uh, uh, have sold pretty well in the last year. Um, despite COVID, despite uh, what you might think, it's the low-grade products that really are either hard to sell, can't sell, or they're just not very valuable. Um, that's where your challenge is going to be. It's probably going to be right now. How's how's cedar? I don't I don't really know. I mean, usually cedar usually you can sell cedar because uh, I would I would think because it's if you can sell it into the the uh, shingle market, Peter, I would guess that, you know, I'm guessing that there's a pretty good demand for cedar shingles right now and, and other, you know, anything you're going to use on a, on a building and cedar would typically fall into that category. I'm guessing the market is pretty decent for cedar. That would be my guess, but I don't deal with cedar very often. Okay. One thing I would tell you to look for, uh, and it's a bit outdated, but the state publishes uh, the main stumpage, annual stumpage reports. If you just Google Maine annual stumpage reports, and I, they're usually a year or two behind, um, mm. but they give you a general sense of where the product ought to be. So um, for just example, like pine, uh, I think down in the area I work, it's listed at somewhere around 180 to 200. And that's not a bad estimation. Sometimes it's a little bit higher for good quality stuff, but those, uh, those documents will give you a, a pretty good ballpark so you can know when you go talk to a contractor, if they hit you 50% lower, um, you could ask them why and, and hope they have a good answer for you. In, in our monthly newsletter, we, um, we, do, we do provide a, a market updates, probably what, four or five, six times a year, maybe, Jen, whenever, whenever we can. Four, 
We try about, to do four. Yeah. Yeah, four times. Uh, you know, and depending on if markets, sometimes they don't change much, but we try to provide a market update for folks to get a sense of where the markets are now and where they might be going, to just give a general sense. How about where I live? All the red oak that are raining down the brown tail moss. I'm that have any value right now? <laughs> I think red oaks, again, red oaks saw logs, they make lumber out of that. that red oak, I think, has rebounded. It was not a popular, it's not, you know, it's been out of favor a little bit for cabinet, cabinetry and, you know, things like that, but it's coming back a little bit. So I think the market is pretty good for quality red oak. For the low grade, it mills don't want it to make paper. Um, so the mills will only take a little bit of it in the in the in the pulp market, and then firewood dealers don't necessarily want it because it's great firewood, but most people want to let it sit two years to, to dry, mm -hmm. and so low grade oak is is not a has been a somewhat difficult product to move at times. The trick the trick I found with oak, uh, and this may be more of a southern Maine thing, but um, a lot of the times when some of these mills are, are really crying for what they call white wood, um, which is your aspen red maple, they're more willing to take a higher percentage of red oak per load. Mm -hmm. um, that hasn't been the case as of recently because of the poor markets, people have really been cutting, doing what we call cutting the markets. They're cutting the wood they can sell and really pushing those markets full. Um, so it's not the case right now, but in some cases you can get away with selling some lower quality red oak. Um, if you do have a, a larger portion of aspen and maple to sell with it. So the brown tail moth question, I think, Peter, I think you were, that you, you were talking about brown tail moth too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean that if you've noticed the, and probably you're familiar with brown tail moth is more of a public health issue with the, the hairs that are toxic than it is a forest health issue, but you know, you're going to see pretty soon oak trees that look like um, there were no leaves on them. And you, you'll see that particularly on oak, it affects other species. I think, I, I think they'll survive, but nobody, you know, if it year after year after year after year of this happening is going to affect the, you know, the vigor of some of these oak trees. Yeah. And you combine that with gypsy moth or some other, uh, some other pest or pathogen, you get multiple defoliations in a single growing season and you start to see mortality. Yeah, they're really defoliating the, the red oaks in my yard here. I'm in Farmingdale. Yeah. Just horrendous. Yeah, it'll look like it'll look like winter here on some place. So you'll be driving along the highway and you'll look up and you'll see all these trees with no leaves. That's most likely um, brown tail moth. So. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in here. That was a good segue, by the way, to our uh, one of our June events we're doing. We're, we're actually going to have a um, our the entomologist and the pathologist from the Maine Forest Service lead a tour in Raymond on June 22nd on um, in talking about the health uh, for oak and pine and and talking about disease and pests that are becoming problematic. And uh, so uh, check our website. Uh, uh, our events page has all, a listing of all of our June in-person uh, in events. We're, we're back doing in-person events um, and we're gonna taper off on the online programs until we get back into the fall. So, and there'll be plenty of other interesting programs that we try, we'll try to do throughout the, um, th throughout the state. We really appreciate everybody here today. Um, our next online program is gonna be next week. It's gonna be TikTok on Tuesday for the Lisa Ballman. So again, you'll find that on our website, um, on our events page. And then we will have an invasive plants talk with Nancy Olmsted in June, June 17th. So lots of uh, topics that came up today, we'll be following up with in, going in depth in those programs. And if you're not a member yet, that's one of the number one steps you take as a new woodland owner, as you become a member of Maine Woodland Owners, you get a monthly newsletter, you have access to expertise like we have today with Jeff and, and Tom and also our website's full of resources. So we hope you'll join us if you're not already a member and we hope that you have a good rest of your night tonight and we will look forward to seeing everybody again either online or in person um, and give us a call or send an email to mainwoodlandowners.org, Tom at or Jen at J-E-N-N. -N. We'd love to hear from you and Jeff. I have Jeff's email listed as well. So hopefully this was helpful. We'll try to do it again later in the, in the year. 
and uh, spread the word about, about our work and our members program. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.